You know what I do when I'm sitting in a darkened theater waiting for the show to begin? I pray. Oh dear God, please let it be a good show and let it be short, oh Lord, man, please. Two hours is fine, but three hours is too much. <laughs> and keep the actors out of the audience, God. I didn't pay good money to have the fourth wall come crashing down around my ears. I just want a story and a few good songs that'll take me away. I just want to be entertained. I mean, isn't that the point? Amen. You know, there was a time when people sat in dark in theaters and thought to themselves, Ooh, what if George and I were very sure got for us today? Or, can Cole Porter pull it off again? Can you imagine? Now it's, please, Elton John, must we continue the charade? You know, there was a time when people sat in dark in theaters and knew that when the lights came up, they'd be taken to another world, a world full of color and music and glamour. And you thought to yourself, my God, when are they going to bring out the lights? Oh, how things have changed. Hello, how are we today? I'm feeling a little blue myself, a little anxious for no particular reason, a little sad that I should feel anxious at this age. You know, a sort of self-conscious anxiety resulting in a non-specific sadness. A state that I call blue. Whenever I feel this way, blue, I like to listen to my music. So I was searching through my records this morning, and yes, records. <laughs> I was about to listen to Meredith Wilson's The Music Man. I had a craving for a young Ronnie Howard. But then I said, no, let's have a treat. Let's disappear for a while to the decadent world of the 1920s, where the champagne flowed and the cat yard still, and all the world was a party. For the wealthy, anyway. So I dug it back, and what did I find? But one of my favorite records, Gable and Stein's The Drowsy Chaperone. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> Music by Julie Gable, lyrics by Sidney Stein. <laughs> well, it's a two record set remastered from the original recording in 1928. It's the full show with the original cast, including Beatrice Stockwell as the chaperone. Isn't she elegant? <laughs> It was a full 15 years before she became Dame Beatrice Stockwell. Can you believe it? <laughs> well, let me read you what it says on the back. It says, mix ups, mayhem, and a gay wedding. <laughs> of course, the term gay wedding has a different meaning now. <laughs> but back then, it just meant fun. And that's just what this show is. Fun. So, would you, would you indulge me? Would you let me play this record for you now? Yes! yes. Well, I was hoping you would say yes. <laughs> Oh, we're 
when someone tell me why everything fun? Yes, yes, your dress, your fantasy dress, was such a pleasure, and you would be speeching and preparing. God bless your dress, this one my dress, and I will tell you why you put it on. When you know the ring, when you know the child,
I'll lead you to this record as best I can. Don't worry, it won't be hard to follow. So we begin. <laughs> well, I just wanted to thank you all for coming. I tell you, I must be some lucky fellow. Why, who would have thought that I, Robert Martin, would be married a glamorous showgirl? And that that glamorous showgirl would be willing to give up a successful career for me, Robert Martin. Oh. Now, if it weren't for Prohibition, I'd say let's raise a glass. Here, here. To Miss Janet Van Graaff, the most beautiful girl in all the world. Absolutely not. Excuse me? The crew wants to see his bride of the day the wedding is bad luck. I hope you heard that. Because that's the plot. Basically. <laughs> Hang on for the ride. Breakfast will be served in the Arabian room. Say, it's a little early in the day to be drinking, isn't it? I don't understand the question. Look, you keep Janet away from Robert, you understand? You're in the chaperone. That's your only job. I, I'm not going to Robert, who's my little monkey? Oh, I am. I'm your little monkey. So, the bride and the groom are whisked away, and we turn our attention to the B-plot, which involves the producer. The last time you don't got what it takes. But I've been taking lessons. Singing, acting, ballet. Ballet? Yeah, I'm pretty good too. Last week I auditioned for Swan Lake. <laughs> a little annotation here. The Kitty and Felsing were a couple of real rocks, Jack and Sadie Adam. Now there's a familiar comic construct, a stupid woman with a long suffering companion. Well, at least she appears stupid. She does something in the end that makes everyone question whether it was all just an act. The irony here is that Sadie, well, she, she actually was quite stupid. Uh, Jack had to explain all the jokes to her, apparently. Anyway, she still had a wonderful career on the stage. But back then, the theater was the only place stupid people could earn a decent living. <laughs> now it's just television. <laughs> Kitty, I don't have time for this. A bed for Mr. Belton! Perhaps a nice profiterable. Boy, I've got to agree. Then perhaps we can give you something else to do. Yeah, like something that ain't food. What? Your confusion is to be expected. Although we've seen it before, even the guys of innocent pastry chefs, we also, and primarily, employees of a certain individual. A certain individual? A certain individual who happens to be the largest single investor in the six follies. He has sent us here as a pastry chef to express his concern about Miss Van Graaff's impending nuptials, specifically as she gets married and leaves the show, then there ain't no show. Say, don't I know you? No, you don't. Have you ever spent any time in Toledo? Have you ever spent any time in a coma? No, but I have a cousin in Seattle. Kitty, <laughs> boy, you tell your boss this wedding ain't never gonna happen. You have my word. Oh, we'll take your word, all right. But to go back on that way would be a recipe for disaster. Now, I hope we have made ourselves perfectly eclair. One can only hope. <laughs> you be sky, you be kidding me. Try to watch all the time, baby! Right. Then drop the picture, Chef Routine. Alas, we get ash, we're on the lamb. <laughs> Lamb's an entree, you macaroon. <laughs> <laughs> the gangsters are played by an interchangeable vaudeville duo of the Tall Brothers, John and Peter Tall. They were born Abram and Mendel Moskoskowitz, but were renamed at the time by an immigration official. They're an early example of a typical Broadway gangster full of wordplay and stylized movements. Uh, nothing to be afraid of. Unless <laughs> you find dancers intimidating. <laughs> Which I do. But for reasons that wouldn't be appropriate for the situation. Leave that in your hands, Mr. Foxy. In the meantime, feel free to browse the dessert carousel. Try the Toledo surprise. It's to die for. Holy cats, Mr. Felting! They're gangsters! Very deceptive. Now, go tell your face. I gotta stop this 
this wedding. But how? How? Oh, dear Lord in heaven! How? <laughs> I always thought that home was a little old play. <laughs> anyway, with the story well on its way, let's go to the groom's room.
your name above mine in the marquee. <gasps> oh, Victor, I think this is the end. You do with that. You couldn't be more wrong. I don't want to show up no more. I don't want to sing to
Jane Roberts. She was the Oops girl, remember? Oh, sure, you remember the Oops girl. Don't you people read? She was billed as a girl whose sexual energy was so great that it caused men around her to have accidents. <laughs> Spill their drinks, drive their cars in the trees. If she would go, what? Well, I'm not really doing it much justice, but people ate it up. They made a whole series of films. Oops, the Oops Girl, Oops Girl Come Home, oh, and Oops Girl at Sea, and won an Oscar for special effects. Okay, that game is probably to work. On the plan B, for that, I'm going to need the cops. Someone call me Oops Girls. I need a, how oh, do you call them? I got here! <laughs> la 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 la! In walks Adolfo, self proclaimed ladies' man. Adolfo was played by former silent film star and world class alcoholic Roman Martelli. He was the one who later drank himself to death at a chateau in Nice, remember? Well, it wasn't until five days later that they found his body, and by the time they had, it had been partially consumed by his coons. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I don't believe we've met. I am Adolfo. You are Adolfo? Yes, I am. Adolfo, not the Adolfo. Yes, I am. Adolfo. Funny. You don't look like a scoundrel. Je what? Why? Just now, I heard the drone saying that Adolfo was a scoundrel. What? Algorithm of a scoundrel? Very good. Algorithm of a scoundrel? It's like I'm hearing it again. <laughs> this is outrageous. He says this to peoples? To, to beautiful ladies with breasts for making love? Why, I must. I must. You must. You must take matters into your own hands. Yes. I must uh, take this room into my hands and take it. Yes, no, don't kill him. Her house, we can't get him there. Show me to this room. Wait, what? What type of man is this room? A big man. Well, a burly fellow. He's big on the outside. No, no, no. A dog will not fight this big man. Small. Hey. Wheezy little dwarf people that a dog will kind of hunt far away. But no big man. You're a, you're a lover trying to fight. Yes, Adolfo is a lover, beautiful <laughs> lady. Some say I am the king. Well, you know what they say the best way to get revenge on a man is through his door. No, the best way to get back at a man is through his window. No, <laughs> revenge. Back at a man through his. Through his there is no other way. I'm not Santa Claus coming down the chimney. Through his. Yes, ma'am. It ain't prohibition after all. I will have that, ma'am. 
would have to use code words. For instance, if someone asks for a glass of ice water, it really means they want a glass of vodka. Have you got that? Yes, ma'am. Are you sure? Maybe you should write it down. Uh, I understand, ma'am. A glass of ice water is a glass of vodka. What's a glass of ice water? Vodka. Ice water? Vodka. Ice. Vodka. Very well then, it's settled. One less thing to do. I'm reading. My ladies have a glass of ice water. I found her meeting with the pastry chef's rather trying. And I would certainly enjoy a glass of refreshing ice water. Your ice water man.
If I'm going to be, if I'm going to serve a woman, I prefer to be paid for my efforts. <laughs> oh, you too. I know it seems crazy to develop a successful career to marry a man you hardly know. But somehow, for some reason, when I look into his eyes, his big monkey eyes, oh gee, I get all woozy. And that's not, isn't it? Not necessarily. The woozy has to be caused by any number of things, I mean. And woozy right now, I'm certainly not the law. <laughs> Beatrice Stockwell was famous for her rousing anthems. She inspired and entertained troops, troops in every major world conflict up to and including the Falklands War. Of course, by that time, the anthems didn't so much rouse as stupefy and consume in her late 80s, but still, she demanded that the rousing anthem be placed into every show she ever did. And he just couldn't say no to her. That star power. Really, you're not being the least bit helpful. Couldn't you at least allay my fears in the future with words of inspiration? Inspiration?
when she was, regardless of the major concerns of others. My mother was like that. <laughs>
that well, it's not food. <laughs> but that's what musical theater is all about, right? Romantic Oh, 
nothing ever works out. And the only people who suddenly burst into song are the hopelessly enraged. <laughs>
time for the intermission. Well, at least it would be if we were actually in the Roscoe Theater watching the Drowsy Chaperone, which of course we're not. I don't like intermissions. They ruin the magic, you know? They get you out of the moment. One second you're watching the Drowsy Chaperone, and then back you're surrounded by tourists. Critically, candy bar rappers and the mattering of the lack of women's best fat lap restrooms is really just cruel. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a power bar. <laughs> I have a bit of a blood sugar issue. Uh, I have to eat small meals throughout the day or I little, get a little bit crazy. <laughs> I know, it's true, but you weren't like the alternative. <laughs> Believe you me. Believe you me. I remember my wedding day. I had eaten breakfast and the ceremony wasn't until four in the afternoon. Ah! I knew, I knew! Yeah. Oh, you're surprised. I was married. <laughs> well, there you are. You shouldn't go around making assumptions about people, should you? No, I'm a very complicated person. I have to pee now. <laughs> but I'll be quick, I promise. And when I return, we'll begin the second act of Johnny Chapro. Thank you. 
There are no Phil, no Fitzpatrick and ukulele Lil. I don't know what's out there. I suppose ukulele Lil played the ukulele. She doesn't in the show. I tried to find out more about her. I went through all my books. I even, I even tried the internet, but all my searches ended in tiny tips off tops and photographs. <laughs> anyway, they're both charming. Why would the past be so moved? The bride has called off the wedding already. Oh, Andre and Lady, never listen to a bride on her wedding day. Love is a very complex emotion, Andre and Lady. Yes, ma'am. You see, you can be very close to someone one minute, and the next, why you just want to stare at them then? Do you understand? I'm familiar with the urge to strangle you, yes. You see, that's just the nature of love. But here's a fact on which we can depend. Just let a long road and a rodeo love to me. Yeah. And love is always lovely in the end. But Romeo and Juliet was a tragedy then. Oh, I never read reviews. <laughs> love can start a quarrel. Love can cause a din. Love, isn't it? Yes, yes, that is love. And me. 
<laughs> there you are. All right, I'm going to put my cards on the table. Got a weak heart, can't take a breath. If this goes on any longer, the old ticker's going to get out. Please, just tell me. Is there going to be a wedding or not? Yes. Thank you, good Lord in heaven. Hold on, I'm going to shout out for her. Get married. What? There you are. I have a idea for you. There's going to be a wedding. We know. We know. Yes, we just heard. But who told you? Oh, I did it. But how did you know? Well, what difference does it make? Mrs. Tolton, Dan, and I are going to be married in the garden at 7 30 this evening. What? what? Can't you find it in your heart to marry me, Jane? It's our wedding day. George's gone, all this trouble, and... Well, I do love you. More than I can say. But you kissed another woman! Yes, and I just can't understand it. I know it sounds ridiculous, but when I was kissing that French woman, why, it was just like I was kissing you. Oh, brother, you were kissing me. You mean, you were me, me? Wow, that French accent was remarkably accurate. I just don't know. Oh, are you so confused, chaperone? Please, I beg you just this once. Give me advice that is coherent and appropriate to the situation. Should I marry Robert? And here it comes. The moment I was talking about. Not only the culmination of the plot, but a part that has fascinated me more than any other. Brought me back to this record again and again. Here it comes. Well... My advice to you is... And this is it. Listen. You, you see, you can't quite make out what she says because somebody drops a cane. I'll play with you again. <laughs> she's saying live while you can or leave while you can. I know it's Beatrice Stockwell, so it may just be a cynical quip. But she's right, isn't she? Live or leave. And you have to live. Because you do love her in some way. It's not an exact science. An arrow doesn't just fall out of the sky and point to the one you're supposed to be with. So you say to someone one day, you say, I love you. And you basically phrase it as a question, but they accept it as fact. And before you know it, there she is. Standing in front of you in a three thousand dollar dress with tears in her eyes, and her nephew made you hump up. So what do you say? You say I was kidding, I was joking. No, you can't. You live, right? You have to live. So for a couple of months, you stare at that alien form in bed beside you, and you think to yourself, Who are you? Who are you? And then one day you say it out loud. And then it's trial separation and couples counseling and all your conversations are about her eating disorder and your Zoloft addiction. And you're constantly re-editing and re-evaluating and revisiting until you finally lose the deposit on the house. And your whole co and your whole relationship ends on a particularly ugly note. With your only copy, copy of Gypsy spinning through the air and crashing up against the living room wall. <laughs> but still, in a larger sense, in a broader sense, it's better to have lived than left, right? Oh, yeah. You have no idea how many times I've listened to that. <laughs> oh, Chaperon, you certainly have a way with words. Rot, my answer is yes. I will marry you. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Mr. Bell. Thank <laughs> you. 
shut the power off because we're replacing the breaker panel with the base. Yes. So we replaced it, but um, when we turned the power off, all the breakers tripped in the apartments. Yes. That's what happens. It's normal. Yes. So um, I got to reset the breakers. Now, hey, I want to take a second. All right, all right, all right. Because, uh, you know, I tried to call you earlier before, but... <laughs> I've been having a, a problem with my phone. <laughs> Oh, 